Ken Rosenberg, thank you very much for being here. You are a widely recognized lawyer in all sorts of publications. You've been a lawyer for a long time and at the highest levels you've um, litigated in all levels of court. You have some high profile clients and cases. Uh, you're currently a, a partner at a big firm. I'd love to hear all about it and I'd like to start at the beginning with pre-law school days. What where did you get your sense of justice from and what encouraged you to study law? Let's start there. So I'm, I'm going to answer your questions in a, at a human level, not a technical level. I'm not sure the, the demographic of your audience, but I grew up in Winnipeg. I was born and raised there. I moved to Toronto in 1976 to go to law school. The ripe old age of 19. I. When I was a child, being a lawyer wasn't a uh, wasn't a long held aspiration. But I I believe the first time I thought of being a lawyer was watching To Kill a Mockingbird, the movie in the early '60s, maybe '63 or '64. Then I wanted to be, of course, a auto racer, a fireman, all the thing, a cowboy, all the things little boys want to be. And then maybe in grade nine, I, it hit again. I saw a movie on Man for All Seasons with Paul Schofield about Sir Thomas More and Henry VIII. I realize now it's much more fiction than reality, that movie. And the idea hit me again between wanting to play basketball and being a world champion, something or other, a musician maybe. And then when I went through high school and university, I have to say, to those who think that there's a guiding light in people's lives, it's called your parents. And my parents said, why don't you be a lawyer? Next thing you know, I had applied to law school after graduate, or before I graduated from the university. And I ended up going, not because I had a driving ambition. I had these little tokens of memory and ideas of justice and and uh, going through Talmud Torah and other, other learning experiences. I knew a little about the law and the Talmud, but they were all snippets. Why did I really go to law school? Because my parents said, go to law school. And if that meant getting out of Winnipeg and living on my own, so I'll go to law school and that'll get me to Toronto. And that's the, that's the truth. Where I grew up, country and Western music was, was big in my youth. Not so much so from people not from Western Canada or rural areas. Uh, there's a country song called Bright Lights, Big City. So coupling law, getting out of Winnipeg, nothing wrong with Winnipeg. I just had an urge to see the world. I came to Toronto and went to law school. When I was in law school, I enjoyed it. I never knew that 40, what is it, are we now 45 years later, I'd still be doing it. But I am, and I guess the punchline to it all is, after all these years, half the time I still can't wait to get to work because I like what I do half the time to be honest I'm old I'm tired I don't need to read another contract I'm tired of my client or I'm just tired of of, of life uh, in the law but half the time it's exciting because you're helping people you're solving problems you're there's puzzles to figure out and that's what I like that's really the long and short of my career Wow, unbelievable. I mean, it's it's good to enjoy what you do. Sounds like you do at least 50% of the time. Was it always like that? Can you tell us what was your first job in law? Um, were you, you you went straight straight into litigation? Did you, did you have major mentors along the way? I've had so many mentors. I've never done an interview like this. I'm reluctant. I, I'm not a, I have a, I know I have a big personality but I'm more of a extroverted introvert. And I think many lawyers are, I have a stage presence. Um, how did I get into litigation? I articled a firm called Goodman's mm -hmm. and they do a rotation system. And when I was in law school, I did some litigation. I did with class community legal aid, Ontario and the Osgood group. I liked, litigation, but I thought I was going to be a securities and tax lawyer. 
when you look at my transcript, I took the usual survey courses and I took three or four tax courses and a few securities courses and I did well and I went to Goodman's because they were no securities and tax firm. Mm -hmm. And I did real estate, then securities and tax, and then an admin law rotation. And my last rotation was litigation. And that's where I fell in love with litigation. I realized I liked doing the other stuff. I, I enjoyed the challenge of the different areas of law and this work is fascinating. But once I had the taste of litigation, I was to turn it into a dime store novel seduced by it. And I thought whatever I do, whether it's tax, securities, corporate, I also have to have some component of litigation. And I was strained very early. Cliff Lax was the head of the department then mm -hmm. before he went off to Lax and Sullivan and John Keefe was my mentor. And they all said, I'm known as Ken in Toronto, but back then I was Kenny. Kenny, you have to specialize. And, and the long and short of it was I didn't stay at Goodman's. They helped me find a job at a firm called Strathy Archibald and Seagram. And the advice given to me, and I give the same advice to young people who want to be litigation lawyers, you have to get on your feet. You can't be a research best role or just always sitting in second and third chair. You have to get on your feet. And at the time, the advice was go to Old City Hall and be Crown or something like that. Don't do it for too long. If you want to do larger cases, you have to learn about preparation, but get comfortable on your feet. Do that, do labor law grievances, do collection work, but do something where you're always on your feet to get comfortable. It's as if you're using the musical analogy. It's one thing to sit and study music, but if you want to be a performer, you have to get used to performing. I went to a firm called Strathy Archibald and Seagram doing collection work and it was the best choice I ever made. Back when I started, people think things are bad now. Interest rates were prime was 20 to 22%. We were enforcing notes in the normal course at 24%, mortgages at 20%. There was no shortage of work. I was on my feet all the time. After my first five years, before I went into government for three years, um, I probably had done dozens of trials dozens of motions, hundreds of discoveries. And let's not pretend, it was like cleaning out the elephant cages. These are cases where one in a hundred people would have any defense. They're just, you owe the money you couldn't pay and you learn not just the practice of law, you learn not just the practice of litigation, you also had to gain an emotional intelligence to understand that sometimes the judge wouldn't be with the bank and would be with the poor family that was just trying to get by and they couldn't pay 20, 24 percent interest rates. So it was a great learning experience. So that's where it started for me. And that's how I got into litigation. And I haven't looked back. I could have enjoyed other areas of practice, but I would have missed the opportunity to be in court and the adrenaline rush and excitement of that. Right. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, in law, you can find so many different paths. And uh, I, I had a little taste of litigation, but I actually didn't like it because you wake up every day and you have to go to fight. Uh, whereas uh, solicitor work, you're just transactional. You're trying to help people get the deal done or, or draft a will or whatever it is. There's not as, as much conflict. So you seem like a, a nice guy, calm guy. I'm wondering what, what attracted you to the conflict of litigation? It was the sport of litigation. It, and when I started, I did a criminal, but after about two years, again, I was told, you have to choose, and I'll, I'll make a bit of a joke out of it. Strathy Archibald and Seagram was in Commerce Court. It was a, people would use the word establishment firm. Some of my colleagues didn't like some of my clients sitting in the waiting room while well, a banker or a corporate executive is there and somebody on a break and enter is sitting waiting to see me but you have to choose so why did i like it i loved sports as a child and i played a lot of sports and i was 
without being self-effacing. I was strong and I was fast, but I'm not well coordinated. So I never really got good in any sport at a very high level, whether it be hockey, football, I played baseball, golf. I guess football, I could have been just a smash mouth kind of person. Mm -hmm. But I like team sports and I like the energy of sports. All this say, say the same thing about my very dull uh, music career. I, I played music my whole life. I'm not very good, but I'm not too bad at litigation. And I enthused my way into it because it had that element of competition, it had that element of excitement, like any performance art or sport. Mm -hmm. And after many decades at it, there was a commercial when I was a kid, I don't know if you'd be familiar with it or your generation, about trick cereal and some, and the punchline was tricks are for kids and litigations for kids. If you have a mentality, a youthful mentality, whether you're 70, 60, 30, or 80, you'll like litigation. But when you're world weary, you think litigation is the stupidest thing you've ever been involved in. You know, truth by combat. Uh -huh. And it's an interesting theory. Uh, my partner, Chris Pallier, is in his 70s, and he's the most youthful, youthful person I know when it comes to litigation. It's just exciting. It's fun. You have a new client. And whether the, we're the good guys or the bad guys, everybody's entitled to a defense. And it energizes you to do the best job you can within the rules. And I mean that. If, if you don't have the rules, what's the point? And it's it's a performance art and a sport. And when you're young and youthful and excited, it's the best. If you're world weary, you've had a problem, you've had a fight with your wife or a fight with your kids and you're not in a good mood, it can be very tiresome uh -huh. litigation. I, I hope that. that gives you some insight. It's the insight into me. I, that's and what this is about, definitely. Uh, learning, learning what uh, makes you 42 tick. Forty-two years later, some days I just can't wait to deal with the matter. And to be honest, some days I go, "Oh God, do I have to go and deal with this thing?" <laughs> right. I mean, everyone has those days. What, what do you do to overcome that? How do you go to a, a big trial, a big appearance in front of a court on those days where you're just not feeling it? There's two things that I've done in my life professionally for many years, obviously law. And the other was I was a canoe, canoeist, canoe tripper, oh, counselor, nice. and then a outdoor guide. And what keeps, honest to goodness, what keeps me going is those days where you have this gruesome portage, where you're carrying a canoe from one lake to another, and, it's all a slog and it's raining, it's cold, it's whatever. And you put one foot after the other and eventually you get there and there's no better feeling than that accomplishment. Not when it's easy and exciting, but you've made it through. And that's what keeps me going. I, it's just one foot after another, you do it, you're a professional, you're not an amateur, people rely on you. I don't think you understand the burden of that until you do have a day like that, but you have clients. And in some of the files I deal with, which are group, whether they're class claims, they do a lot of work in solvency for pension stakeholder groups, uh, like pensioners of Stelco or pilots at Air Canada. It's not just about you. And I think most of the really good lawyers I know some are egomaniacs, narcissists, and it's just about them. But you can't go that far in our profession. You have to have an emotional IQ, empathy and sympathy. When you're really feeling lousy and you don't want to be there, but you have to be there, you put your head down, you keep doing it, and you realize it's not just all about you. That sounds like cheap psychology, but I believe it to be true. I believe it, it to be true. It expresses itself in many different ways. Absolutely. I, I also agree. And feel that you can't succeed in anything if you're uh, f all ego. You have to realize it's about outside of you, others. And that's part of our profession. You're here to help others. You're not here to serve yourself. You won't get anywhere. Um, Hillel started about 500 years before uh, before the Common Era. I don't know when Hillel was alive, maybe not 500 years. But if not, if only for me, 
who am I? That's absolutely right. So, I mean, there's a lot of litigators out there. I mean, this is one of the traits that I think have got you to the highest of levels. But in your opinion, was there any event or case or job or anything that really propelled you forward? Anything stand out of your career? There are many over. What were the early ones? What was the first one where you thought, okay, I've made it. I'm a litigator. Well, I still feel that someday somebody's going to figure it out and <laughs> and I'm a fraud inside, so I don't think I've ever made it. You can never, this is a serious comment. I'm not comparing myself to Michael Jordan, but Michael Jordan was one of the great af- team sport athletes of my lifetime. Whether he was the greatest of all time doesn't matter. He was great. And Michael Jordan would get butterflies before games and ask himself, can I do it tonight? And I still have those feelings. And I think anybody who achieves in life, whether it's law, music, sports, um, it doesn't matter. You're an administrator in a company and you have to deal with HR issues. How You have to prepare yourself mentally, physically. You have to have a game plan. You have to have a theory of your case. So with that, I honestly mean it's continuous improvement and never ends. You can always do it better. Mm-hmm. When I look back, I had many cases, but my my the turning point for me, you have many victories and many losses. I tend to remember both my losses because you learn more from loss than you do from a victory. And having said that, my great moment wasn't winning the Nortel case although I should have retired after then, I'll never have another case like that. But I was about two years out and one of our biggest clients in strategies was the CIBC. And a vice president of the CIBC called the, one of the senior most partners and said, my nephew has just been charged with a criminal matter and I need a defense lawyer. So they turned to me and I thought, no, I, I'm making it so they should go to Eddie Greenspan or somebody. Why me? And the partner had faith in me. He said, look, it's a young guy. It's a driving offense, etc. You should do it. Well, I prepared like I've never had prepared for a case. It's a criminal matter. I remember it well. It was at Burnham Fort Road, just under the hydro wires. And the guy was driving with traffic beyond the speed limit. And he slammed into a back of a car on the road it just happened to be a cop car and the cop was watching and and a whole thing ensued and when you're in law school or taking an advocacy course you learn about looking at the police officer's notes testing the evidence and i won that case on cross-examining the cop he could not resist lying he had my guy dead to rights, but he embellished the case. I got him on, it's still one of my favorite cases, like 40 years ago, where I, I got him in a textbook way, stretching the evidence, then breaking the evidence and lying. And eventually the courtroom, you have to understand it. You're, there's so much pressure to settle and plead to some lower offense. My guy wouldn't plead to the lower offense. So we have a trial. It's filled with other young offenders and the judge just wanted to get it over with. And I was successful in in exposing the police officer for, for uh, not being a truth teller. And the judge threw out the case and he was mad at the cop. He was mad at me, he was mad at everybody because now he had a courtroom full of people who wanted to go to trial and not plead. That's a very long story, Abby, but I'll never forget that case. And that was, if I didn't have the bug before then, just a, just a, a warm feeling after that case. Never look back. Never look back. That's incredible. And then I stopped doing criminal law. And you don't get a lot of that in civil law because criminal is, is, is like checkers. It's a few moves. Checkers is a very hard game. But it's a few moves makes the game. Chess is usually a little more complex, and civil's like chess. 
and you you prefer the civil i mean why why did you land up leaving criminal law you could have been a, an eddie greenspan over there and why why do you go into uh, civil law was that just the the files that came in or where you were working how, how does one develop i a think career? it was a combination of where i was working and i'd been in a nest of criminal lawyers where a lot of my friends were from law school i might have stayed with it my firm said look you've got to pick it's we're glad you did it for a few years it's great training mm -hmm. but you're going to be progressing through civil cases not through criminal you have to specialize this this is again very personal things they don't teach you at law school that's you why we do this by the way you become friends with your clients in a civil context you don't become friends with your clients in a criminal context uh -huh. you may be friendly with them but you don't go out for dinner you don't socialize typically mm -hmm. with your clients and criminal and i have a social gene in me and i became friends with with clients you become part of a food chain of work you see where the firm's work is going to take you and criminal was a complete outlier i stopped I stopped going. I still remember the first time I went to, we call them jails, but they're detention centers to meet your client in custody. And the bars close behind you. It's a very sobering feeling for everybody, including the lawyers, first few times you've done it. And it's just a different world. Mm -hmm. And the two worlds don't, they're, sure there's white collar crime civil lawyers do, but it's a different sport and it's a different game and tennis players don't become badminton players they may look similar or squash players don't become badminton players it's a different game a different technique and i realized early you have to pick one or the other and i i chose civil i don't have a great red over mm -hmm. but nice it tricks are for kids criminal or for the, the criminal is for the ones who really are young and and over the years, I've had cases where clients have been served with search warrants and I've engaged with criminal lawyers and we've done cases together. It's, it's a different kind of game. Beyond a reasonable doubt is a different standard than on a balance of probabilities and it focuses your mind in a completely different way. And there are very, very few lawyers who can play both at the highest levels. Both mm -hmm. You can. It's a lot of work. Even being a one one type of lawyer is a lot of work, so definitely too. It's hard enough to be a, a great violinist, let alone a great violinist and a great piano player. So right. that's puts it in perspective. Right. Not that I'm either, but I'll call you a great civil litigation lawyer. We'll start there. <laughs> let, let me ask you, Ken. Basketball you... coach, basketball coach. That's what I'm. Looking it's good to always have dreams. <laughs> Continue to have dreams. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you, you said you took a bit of a break from law and went into politics. Uh, continue down the career progression. You were busy doing civil litigation at this uh, firm with some great mentors and leaders. What, what was your next step after that? Well, uh, it was great. There's so many people at Strathys. I would name the number one person was Dick Thompson, who passed away in 1985. Um, when I have a moral dilemma, in practice, I don't know what to do. I always ask myself, what would Dick Thompson have done? He was a lawyer at Strathys. He passed away in 85 from cancer in his 50s. Bill Burden, he went on to uh, become chair of Castles Brock, Kevin Alto, uh, a prothonatory in the federal court. And there's so many I could name, Harry Vanderloo, Doug Hunter, but as a sidebar, I was always interested in politics, not putting up signs, knocking on doors. And when I was in the bar admission course in February of 81, there was a uh, provincial election. I'll give a shout out to Peter Lukashevitz. Peter's now the uh, worldwide managing partner of Gallings. So we're in the bar ads together. He knew I'd done some things for the Liberal Party because friends of mine in law school were active in the Liberal Party and were actually working for Stuart Smith, the then leader of the Liberal Party of Ontario, Brad, not Brad, Carol and Tom Zizis and Carol Beckman. So I started knocking and pounding in signs for a guy named Ian Scott. And Ian Scott uh, was a lawyer, he was running. 
He lost that election. Ian ran again in 1984, 85 May, there was an election. So I worked on his campaign. And Steve Gouge, who's a counsel at our firm, who's Court of Appeal judge, was sort of the chair of the campaign. There's Peter, Chuck Virtual, myself, John Ronson. We ran Ian's campaign and he wins after 42 years of continuous one party rule in Ontario by the conservative, the Bill Davis and predecessor conservatives, the liberals formed the government. Needless to say, after 42 years, two generations, there wasn't a lot of experience, a reservoir of experienced people. Mm -hmm. And I was asked if I would go to Queen's Park for a year to just do stuff. I didn't know what it was, but I was asked if I wanted to be a chief of staff or executive assistant, as they call it, to minister. And I naively said yes. And I got a job with a guy named Monty Quinter, and he was in a ministry of consumer and commercial relations, financial institutions. And I said I'd stay a year. I stayed three. I loved it. And eventually I left because you have to grow up. Being a political assistant, you live in the absolute present all the time. It's the most exciting job I ever had. Every day I talked about interesting people, went interesting places, met interesting people. Uh, but as a political assistant, you make very far reaching decisions on no or very limited information. <laughs> Whereas as a lawyer, you're looking at life through a microscope all the time, making very small decisions on a huge amount of information. I love the strain, the stress of it. It was like living life in seven millimeter Panavision. And I think my worst day in politics was usually better than my best day practicing law. But Look, the beauty of it for me, my personality, I dealt with premiers and ministers, prime ministers. But when the lights went out, you weren't there. You were just a shadow. In my last, one of my last tasks in June of 88, uh, we went to Rome. We had an official visit with the Pope, John Paul II, who was one of the most interesting magnetic people I've ever met in my life. Wow. I, I, if Whether you're a person of faith or not, you can say it was like meeting a rock star and meeting somebody touched in a divine way. So I met the Pope and the G7 conference was in Toronto. So I was in the presence. I didn't have the highest security clearance, but I met Mitterrand and Reagan and I met their spouses for sure because we hosted an event for them that I was involved in. Plus, that's the People magazine, us part of it. But I was involved in changing legislation. I found in public life, 90% of what anybody does, whether you're in the US, Canada, France, Israel, not, politicians really don't affect 90% of what's going on. They just don't. You're sort of in the river, and the river of the society takes you out and can't speak to dictators and despots, but so much of it is just built up momentum. But you can change 10%. Leaving aside tone from the top issues, you can change things. The wisdom is like that serenity prayer uh, from Scotland, knowing, having the wisdom to know what you can do and what you can't. Yeah. So that's a long way of saying I did that, and then I had to decide what to do after that, when I was going to grow up. And I thought I'd either go into business or law. And I decided, tells you something about me, I went back to law, I had a number of opportunities, went back to my old firm. Strathys then merged with Gowlings. I chose not to go back to doing banking law and that's what changed my practice forever. I decided, no, I'm gonna build my own practice. And I stayed at Gowlings, and in 2000, 2001, a group of us decided we're litigation lawyers. Gowlings was a fabulous place to work, great people, still many friends there. But here's the thing, if you're gonna be a civil litigation lawyer, you wanna sue people with money to be crass. Mm -hmm. Banks, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, large manufacturers. Um, we, had a, we were unique at Gowlings, and we had a labor side 
practice, we acted for labor unions and we decided to create Pallier Rowland where we would be an independent council firm. We wouldn't act against unions, we'd act for them in insolvency situations and generally my field was commercial law. So I knew there was a niche providing unions and employees and retirees and employee groups with the kind of advice large corporations, bondholders, banks received in insolvency proceedings. And that's, there was a hole in the market. I thought that was a niche we could fill. We've had some success at that. And then I just do general civil litigation. I do work at the energy board. I do work at the, the funeral and bereavement sector and little niches that I picked up while in government. And it, my piece of advice to people who want to be not just a grinder or a minder, but a finder, find areas that aren't as competitively challenged as other areas. You know, find new areas. And lastly, your generation has so many more opportunities than mine ever had with the explosion of artificial intelligence and technology and the areas of law and specialty that are opening. It's like unbelievable. I just, the opportunities are just unbelievable compared to when I started in practice. So that's how I did from government back to practice, merged with Gallings, opened my eyes, found a, a group that, and it somehow tied to Ian Scott, Stephen Gouge. Um, most of my fellow lawyers of my age and stage at Pallier Rowland, Rosenberg and Rothstein were at a firm called Cameron Brew and Scott, which was Ian Scott's firm. And Ian's still on our letterhead, is, although he's passed away as honorary counsel. Wow, Fasc fascinating how a, a career can develop. And then um, you speak about all these uh, high profile cases that you worked on, was that more in your time at uh, Gowlings or uh, afterwards, uh, the Nortel case you, you mentioned yourself. Uh, how does a case like that come up? Tell me about the litigation surrounding a high profile case and the conclusion of it at the end of the day. The most important thing I can tell people about building your network is stay friendly with people. Uh, an old lawyer, it was Dick Thompson at Strathys, who always said to me, treat the corporals like colonels. So one day, maybe the corporal will be a colonel. Mm -hmm. So Nortel, I was the Ministry of Consumer and Commercial Relations and Financial Institutions, and the minister was Monty. And one of the areas we were involved in was pension regulation. Mm -hmm. and the first case I had was first political case because remember we're just in a, the politician's office we don't actually regulate pensions conrad black wanted to take the pension surplus from the dominion store workers and i got out a call from ray kosky and kosky minsky and he started berating me what's the minister going to do we should be ashamed of ourselves we should do this and that Ray will never hear this, but I have to say, I remember it well. I didn't know what he was talking about. Of course, I said all the politically right. It's all we're very concerned. And of course, I'll look into it. So I remember calling some people in the minister's office in the pension group. And they told me what it was about. Fast forward. You know, I'd stayed friendly with them, stayed in touch. And I'd been involved in pension cases, legacy cases. I got a call saying, we have a problem with Nortel. Our existing lawyers are conflicted and we thought immediately of you because we know you've been following this since our days in the ministry together. Mm -hmm. And Nortel had a huge pension deficit, billions of dollars, and the regulator was involved and something called the Pension, Guarantee, pension Benefit Guarantee Fund in Ontario which had a massive liability to Ontario pensioners if it went down. And the next thing you know, we're involved in the Nortel case. And over nine years, we, we dealt with the case. And the litigation was, put simply, 
became a battle for the remainder of assets in Nortel. And the bondholders wanted it all and we pensioners wanted it all. There were three different court proceedings in insolvency. You have to determine this is something called the Comey. And I'm not going to get technical on you, but the center of main interest. Regardless of what all the laws are around the world, what court is going to manage the insolvency and deal with all the foreign law issues? Nortel was so complicated that when they started it, they made a deal with the devil. They started three separate proceedings in Canada, the US, and England, and there lay the tale of the next seven or eight years. Three different courts had to agree on what the procedure would be to split up the loot at the end of the day. Wow. And we acted for the Canadian pensioners, the single largest pensioners were the UK pensioners. There are pensioners all over. At the end of the day, there were about 30 countries, five estates, let's say, and how and where do you adjudicate this? And a decision was made to do the first ever simultaneous binational trial. A judge sat in Toronto and a judge sat in Wilmington, Delaware. The evidence was common. The law was different. They heard the witnesses together and then had to come to separate decisions. Wow. That sounds very unique, involved. by the way. I've never heard of such a thing with different ju jurisdictions hearing a case. There never has been a thing like that. There is an, something called UNSA trial, yeah. and there is a treaty that is being worked on to create a process to deal with this, but it's been going on for decades. I doubt we'll ever achieve anything. So years of procedural wrangling, we ended up with a binational simultaneous trial. And at the end of the day, with dozens of lawyers and I forget how many experts, dozen more experts. Uh, no, there were more than a dozen. In any event, we were allocating 7.3 billion US plus other monies. The court accepted the theory that we put forward that was adopted as well by the pensioners in the UK called pro rata. There were many, many different settlement proposals and we were our settlement, not settlement, uh, allocation theories. At the end of the day, we couldn't settle. Enormous pressure was put on many, many times. We, to be blunt, this is in the public record, the Americans offered us 10 cents on the dollar. We ended up winning 62% of the funds through our pro rata theory. It was all appealed and then it settled and we ended up receiving a 57% of the money and it was on, and now I'm bragging a bit, but it was our theory that we developed out of a thin air called pro rata. It was based on existing theories, but with lawyers around the world were very nice to our little firm and our little group of Canadian lawyers, which included us, us Koskies, McCarthy's, the CAW. We came up with the winning theory. Wow. It sounds like a, a case like that is uh, once in a lifetime. And you can really build your career and your reputation based on a, a big case like that. So, you know, well, I could end my career. I'm no spring chicken. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but that was in the 90s, right? That was a long time ago. So, no, no. That, that decision came out in 2016. Oh, re recently. 2016. Oh, no, there's cases throughout. The Our Canada case was special. Uh, one of the more interesting things I ever did in my life, uh, I, I do a lot of work at the Ontario Energy Board. In the late 90s, I was asked to chair a task force and deregulate, uh, to come up with a plan to deregulate the natural gas business mm -hmm. in Ontario. I'd say more re-regulated, still a heavily regulated area, but make it more competitive. And I, and I wrote a report uh, after nine months and endless consultations that was adopted into legislation in the natural gas business. And the other really interesting brief that opened my eyes. It's not a brief I got, I was lucky enough to work on it. In the late 80s, early 90s, when I was at Gowings, the government of Mexico became involved in the NAFTA negotiations. Mm -hmm. And with Canada and the US, 
I was it at the Ministry of Trade during the free trade negotiations with the U.S. And that truly opened my eyes to how treaties are made. And uh, my job, our, my minister was to quarterback the Ontario response, and I was the minister's assistant at quarterbacking the response to free trade. I went back to practice. And Mexico soon learned that their civil service wasn't up to speed on Canadian and US issues related to the trade talks. And let's say there are 20 different categories, transportation, housing, industry, competition, et cetera, et cetera consumer protection. So the Mexican government hired, hired Sherman and Sterling in the US to be their shadow bureaucracy. And they hired Gowlings in Canada because putting it in human terms, Canada and the U.S. said, oh, our markets are completely open. We want to rip open all Mexico protectionism. But of course, our markets aren't open. There's all kinds of impediments to trade. So we were retained by the Mexican government. And the, the chief contacts at Gallings who received the brief were is now a judge, just, Justice Bella Baba, and Rick Dearden in Ottawa. Rick's, I think, still at Gallings. Ed Bella Baba's a judge. And I worked on that brief. So when you're talking about luminary briefs, it wasn't litigation, it was administrative law, but working for the government of Mexico on that was fascinating. I've had many cases, the privatization of the Bruce Nuclear Power Plant, we were counsel to the Power Works, I was lead counsel on that. That was fabulous. It turned out to be more just strategy than litigation. Mm -hmm. Air Canada, the Stelco insolvencies, Algoma. It's it's been uh, I've had fun, but it's not all luminary files. And I mean this sincerely. I've I've had little files like the guy in Burnham Thorpe Road, files you never hear about, but you actually make a difference in people's lives. Sure, definitely. I mean, it sounds sounds fascinating. All that you've done. Um, I'm curious now, looking back on your career, maybe what kind of advice would you give? that young Ken, whose parents, Kenny rather, that uh, your parents said, uh, you know, you should go study law. And maybe another contemporary young kid in that same situation, what would you advise them? And, uh, you know, it maybe even once someone has decided to go to law school, how would you uh, suggest that they approach their career? I got lucky. I ended up in something and my father for sure was nudging me, pushing me into, and I ended up liking it. And I wasn't so sure that I would. The summer after I graduated from university, I went to Guyana, South America on an exchange program. That was one of the most formative experiences in my life because I had lived in suburban Winnipeg, rural suburban Winnipeg, and thought everybody had a two-car garage and a driveway with a hockey net, a basketball net. And if they didn't, they wanted that. And here I go to the jungle, South America, and I, my worldview, my worldview is enhanced and changed living in a country like Guyana. But I got nudged into an area and I ended up liking it. And the real thing is do what you like and you'll do well. It's too hard to practice law if you don't like it if it's just a job, it, to some extent has to be a calling or it has to hit you at some emotional level. I've heard that less than a third of my cohort are still practicing law. And after 10 years, less than half were in the practice. And I get it. So my advice to young lawyers are, if you like it, keep doing it. Don't worry about the money. Money is a residue of hard work. If you, if you like it, you'll do well. But if you don't, find something else. It's just too hard a way to make a living. If you, I'm not saying I love it. It's not a, it's not a carnival every day. And, and half the time, I fed up with it. But I still find enjoyment in doing it. So that's my advice, Avi. That's great advice. Do what you like. Then, as the law, like, a little bit about music because I'm a lousy musician. I grew up with some good musicians. Mm -hmm. Music's music, whether it's classical, rock, reggae, hip hop, 
you know, one kind of music isn't better than the other. If you like music, do it. Do the kind of music you like. Yes, you have to make a living. The Bible and Talmud tell us that the hardest thing a person has to do is to make a living and, and take care of a family. So it's not all just, you know, playing your own music, but it is <laughs> in the music business. Maybe you do have to do a few weddings, bar mitzvahs, baptisms, but you can also play the music you like. I think law is the same thing. It's a mix. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the area of law, no one area of law is better. And is there any way to distinguish yourself once you've picked an area, once you've figured out that you like what you do, you like law? Uh, you know, it's, it, it's like you said, it's a competitive area. There's not so much uh, competitive advantage, if you will. All the areas, as far as I see, are uh, covered to an extent, maybe some more or less than others. But once you've picked an area of law, and that's why I love doing these podcasts, is I really speak to the the best of the field in whatever someone does and uh, it's a hard question to answer because you're living it so i understand that but uh, if there is such a thing to say about how to really and you've worked with some of the top lawyers in the in the city in the country you know what what do you think made them stand out above all the other classmates that left law or that are still practicing law but not at that level i've had the privilege because of my the nature of my practice to work with some of the great barristers and lawyers in the world from London, Paris, New York, especially Chicago, LA, Toronto, Winnipeg, Calgary. And here's what I've learned. Everybody puts their pants on two legs at a time. And there are great lawyers everywhere. And you can learn from them all and cut through the narcissism and just look at the thing in, in and of itself. You can meet great lawyers everywhere. And what I find about all of them is that are great. They like what they do, maybe for different reasons, and they work very, very hard at it, and they enjoy it, and they enthuse their way through it. So hopefully you can be lucky enough to find out. And again, let's not kid ourselves. Not every day, but they they find something meaningful in their life. They take it seriously and they pursue it. And then it's like that joke. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? What are the directions? Practice, practice, practice. It's not easy. There is no trick. You have to work hard and eventually the I'm filling it with platitudes, but they mean something. Eventually, the cream rises, and it's not because your name's in the paper, and it's not because you're making, you got lucky on some file or some deal, and you're making all kinds of money. It's because you know in your heart you did the best you can, and that was really good, and it puts you at the next level. And, and it's it's sort of like the British professional soccer or football leagues where there's the lower divisions and you work your way up. You don't start at the top, you work your way up. And, and you say I've worked, I have worked with some of the leading lawyers in Canada and US and around the world. You'd be surprised that they're not all New York, Toronto, whereas I've dealt with some really remarkable lawyers all over because they embody that. They like what they do. They're always studying, always improving, always learning. They work very hard. And some have the opportunity to work and shine when the spotlight's on, but many don't. One of my favorite authors, and I learned from my father, he was a big Mark Twain fan. My father had unusual Canadian experience. He grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan it was a rural Jewish farming community. It was a back to land movement, back to Palestine. But his people came from Lithuania and they set up a shtetl, if I almost put a, a Moshav kind of experience in Saskatchewan in a community called Edenbridge. Wow. My mother's family was also a farmer, Jewish farm family in Manitoba. And there's a punchline to this. So my father growing up was a big fan of Mark Twain. Mark Twain wrote a great book. Forget about Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer, the ones you know. 
It's called Captain Stormfield's Visit to Heaven. And Captain Stormfield, New England Yankee, yeah, goes to heaven, and it's so far ahead of its time. Gets to heaven, he's looking around, and I don't want to get too serious about racial issues that still divide us. But he's going, oh, it's interesting. Where are all the white people? How come it's filled with blacks and First Nations people who call them Indians? And, you know, where are all the white people? And, you know, St. Peter or somebody goes, oh, no, no, the slaveholders and the murderers, they don't come. These are the good people. And it's a fascinating story. As I say, it's 100 years ahead of its time. But one of the things that Captain Stormfield's visit to heaven, he's in heaven and he's looking around and he's going, okay, I want to meet the greatest general of all time. Is it going to be Napoleon? Is it going to be Julius Caesar? Is it going to be Sun Tzu, the Chinese general? And he ends up meeting this tailor from Tennessee who's sitting sewing. He's going, who are you? What battles do you fight? And he finds out in heaven, had this guy been given the opportunity, he would have cleared the floor with Hannibal, Napoleon, or <laughs> Julius Caesar. He was the greatest general of all time. It's just you don't know about. I think lawyering in some ways is a bit like that, Avi. I know I'm very flattered that you think that I, from what you've seen of my resume and I've seen the people you've talked to, they're luminaries in their field. There are so many great lawyers out there who may not have succeeded from an outsider's perspective, but are some of the best lawyers I've ever met. They like the Taylor from Tennessee. And, and what I say distinguishes them is their, obviously their native ability, their work ethic, their interest. In so I'd love still to looking for forward to meeting other lawyers. Yeah. I, I could name names, uh, of course, in the large firms. Yes, Bay Street and other areas are filled with great lawyers, but they're all around and they have a common trait. For the young lawyers, they, they like what they do and they enthuse their way through it. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. I mean, your, your Taylor story remind, reminds me of a Reb Zusha story. I don't know if you've heard him, uh, an old rabbi who, when he went up to heaven, uh, they said they didn't ask him, Reb Zusha, why weren't you like Moses or Abraham or all these great people? They said, why weren't you more like Reb Zusha? Meaning, be the best you can be. You all have to fulfill your own potential. Exactly. That's I really right. believe that. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. Thank you very much for your time until now. I want to give you the last word. If there's any uh, last bits of wisdom you want to impart on the younger generation of lawyers among us, uh, feel free before we let you go. I think young lawyers, it's a very challenging time for young people everywhere because the internet brings everything to your door immediately and you're constantly measuring yourself against some unreal examples. Ignorance was a great virtue when I was growing up. It's hard to imagine the world without an internet. I applied to Lou two law schools because my parents wanted me to. One was the University of Manitoba, which I probably would have gone to. My parents said, no, go to Oscar. I had no idea there were all these other law schools around. I guess I somehow knew, but you had to go to the library and pull out the mm -hmm. syllabus. You didn't know a lot, and that protected you and gave you confidence that you were doing things. So number one, and, and this is like the great benefit, the great tragedy of the final world. You measure yourself too instantly against the best this, the best that. There must be 100,000 best lists out there of everything. And we know how it affects teenage girls and young guys and youth, and it, it can whittle away or hack away your confidence. So there's that part. But the opportunities now that exist in the explosion of, of specialty in the world, the explosion of specialty creates niche opportunities for lawyers and business people like we never had. I would have never considered in the 1960s and 70s in Winnipeg that I would could be called as a lawyer in Wilmington, Delaware, to argue a case on Martell, or I have cases now in New York City, and I'm talking as an old guy, the opportunities of client development, specialty development, practice development, 
learning about other areas, you can have a practice that is designed to your tastes mm -hmm. like never before in the history of practice. So you have the leveling and demeaning part of the internet and, yet you have, and technology and yet the explosion of artificial intelligence. One, you know, just one example. There's a book written by Rachel Carson called Silent Spring, which started the environmental movement in it, not started, but jet fueled the environmental movement when she said, where are the birds? Why aren't they singing? Well, it was the problems of associated with DDT. And we didn't know what we were doing when DDT was, was introduced to stop malaria around the world, while it also killed half the birds and, 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 and wildlife. Um, so she wrote a book called Silent Spring. And, you know, be careful what you do. We know not what we do. Well, artificial intelligence, just all the legal issues that are going to come out of that are breathtaking. And your generation sitting on the cusp. Of it. So I get the problems, I get the challenges, but I think there's great opportunity. Find an area you like, and good things will happen. Well, thank you for that. Uh, the future is bright, it sounds. The future is bright, unless we blow ourselves up, which we may do that too. We got to uh, do uh, do what we can to stay safe. So there it is. That's my dare to be great speech. Well, thank you. You've been great, Ken. A uh, world of wisdom and experience. And thank you for sharing those lessons with the rest of us. And I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Well, thank you. And truly all the best. Thank you very much. Bye for now.